Hello everyone. My name is Ram Prasad Rao and I'm an astronomer working for the Sublimiter Array. In this talk, I will cover some ground about antennas in general, radio astronomy antennas in particular. In addition, I will focus on the SMA in the end. There are a lot of topics in this particular talk. Some of them are what's the role of an antenna? What are the different types of antennas that we use? What's a parabolic reflector, which is the most common type that's used in radio astronomy? Uh, some fundamentals of antennas. Uh, talk a little bit about the beam patterns and other properties of antennas. Uh, talk a little bit about the mounts and uh, optics within an antenna. And then finally, I'll end with a few topics on pointing, holography, and polarization, because these three are important when we are considering observations with the SMA. What is an antenna to start with? Let's go to the definition. Uh, and the IEEE defines the antenna is that part of a transmitting or receiving system which is designed to radiate or to receive electromagnetic waves. What this means is that the job of an antenna is to take the radiation that's propagating through space over millions of light years, hitting our telescope, and then focuses it onto a guiding device. And the, at the end of this guiding device is pretty much the detector. There's a fundamental theorem here which we need to consider, and uh, it's a reciprocity theorem. And what this says is that the receive and the transmit properties of an antenna are identical, and this is really key. And what this means is that in order to know how the antenna receives radiation, we can just study how the antenna transmits radiation, and those two are identical. And that will tell us pretty much all the properties of the antenna. I won't cover why antennas radiate. For this, probably you should refer to an electromagnetics textbook or an antenna's textbook, and there's a lot of math, and we will skip that in this particular talk. Here are some common types of antennas, and most of you are probably too young to remember these. Uh, way back then, we used to have uh, TV antennas, which were these rabbit ears. And of course, if you look at walkie talkies, this is the top, and if you remem remove the cap around the antenna, you will see this sort of spiral antenna. Of course, there are other types of TV antennas. These are a couple more common ones. There's also a loop antenna, which is also an indoor type of TV antenna that can be used. Of course, in radio astronomy, we use these uh, radio telescopes, which are made of a big parabolic dish. And that's a very common, most of the most common radio astronomy antennas. And then finally, there's a horn antenna, which is a very simple antenna, but this is also a very fundamental uh, radio astronomy antenna as well. Okay, so let's start by talking about a simple horn antenna. And this is a very basic antenna. And in fact, uh, this antenna, uh, it's, even though it's a simple horn antenna, it's very famous. Uh, and this was used to study initial observations of the cosmic microwave background. And for this, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Penzias and Wilson. And this was a horn antenna, basically a modified horn antenna, which was in New Jersey. So this is how a simple horn antenna works and in here. And so you can see pretty much the waveform as it moves along. It's, it's in the up direction and then down. And then finally, it comes to where this uh, mouth or the transition of the flaring region of this horn is. And this is where the radiation starts to get coupled into space. And slowly, as it propagates along at the front end, here is where it's launched into space. And so this is the free space wave that's launched. So this is the most fundamental uh, or uh, one of the fundamental ways of looking at an antenna, you have a source, you have a transmission line, or a waveguide, and then you have the antenna itself, and then you have the free space radiation. And these horns are still used, obviously, and at the very uh, at, at one of the uh, basic building blocks of the assembly receiver is, is a horn, and this is a horn that works at 3.5 gigahertz. Okay. So now let's move to a parabolic reflector, which is a, a primary element of, of a radio telescope. And uh, why do we use parabolic reflector? Because this is the antenna with the highest gain at frequencies, typically at microwave frequencies and higher. So to understand how a parabolic antenna works, it's good to have some knowledge of conic sections. And so if you took a wavefront, which was a plane wavefront, given by this plane, L, Q1, Q2, and Q3, where Q1, Q2, Q3 are points along that wavefront. And as the radiation travels, it hits the parabolic surface at these points, it comes to a focus. Okay, so this is one of the foci of the, of the telescope. And this, tel this focus is called the prime focus of the telescope. Each conic section have two foci. So this is one of the focus. 
And the other focus of the parabola is at infinity. And so that's what that means. So if you have radiation that starts at one focus, it goes to the next focus. Now there are different types of mounts for this for this parabolic antenna. And the two most common ones are the polar mount and the altaz mount. And the polar mount is a very simple uh, system in which one of the axes actually points towards the pole or the north pole or the south pole. And the advantage of this is that once you have it all aligned and you know the rotational rate, it's just this ideal rate at which the stars move. And so it's very easy to track. Uh, the problem with this system is that it's very hard to build. And once a telescope starts to become larger and larger in size, it's very hard to have a polar axis which is so well aligned. So astronomers and telescope builders move to this, teles this type of telescope, which is called an Altaz telescope, in which there are two axes. There's an azimuth axis around which the whole telescope rotates, and then there's an elevation axis along which it moves up and down. The thing about the Altaz telescope is that uh, everything is under computer control, and you can basically calculate given a source, RA and deck, and the time, exactly what altitude and what azimuth you need to point to. So now that we've talked a little bit about the telescope mounts, let's come to telescope uh, antenna focus arrangements. Uh, these are four common focus arrangement uh, focus focus arrangements that we see at telescopes. The very first one is a prime focus, and basically you have a parabola, and then the radiation that comes and hits goes to a focus. And at the prime focus, you put uh, your receiver or your feed, etc., and that's called a prime focus system. Uh, this is very simple. And the problem with this is that uh, putting a uh, an instrument at the prime focus can be challenging, especially if this instrument is really heavy. And so most radio telescopes don't use this scheme. There are some that do, but most don't. So instead, what we did is we, instead of having a, a mount uh, feed at the prime focus, what we did is we put in a secondary mirror. And the secondary mirror is usually a hyperbolic mirror. And what it does is that instead of having the focus here, this secondary mirror reflects the radiation down, and there's a hole in the middle of the telescope at the vertex, and then you put your feed system back there. And this is called a Cassegrain system. Okay. Again, the problem with this is that uh, even though it's here, it's behind the telescope, uh, the whole, as the telescope moves in elevation, your receiver itself also moves in elevation. So this can lead to some stability issues, etc. So instead, we can make a further modification. It's called a Naismith mount which is a modified Cassegrain. So instead of having your uh, prime, your uh, your receiver at the Cassegrain focus, you put a mirror there. And this mirror is pretty much on sitting on an elevation axis. And then you redirect the radiation off to a side. You may have a little bit more relay optics, etc. And what the advantage of that is you can set it up so that the receiver then is stable under gravity. And that's what the SME uses. So SME uses an A-Smith mount. Uh, for all of these first three uh, focus arrangements, the biggest problem is that you have some level of blockage. So the radiation that comes through the middle, for example, is blocked by the feed in this case, is blocked by the mirror and in these two cases. So sometimes you don't want that. You want to be able to catch as much of the radiation as possible. So instead what you do is you use an offset Cassegrain telescope, where instead of using the whole parabola like this, you only use a part of the parabola and the parabola is set up this way so that the focus is here, the, the prime focus, and then you have your secondary mirror. And so now you see that in this setup, the secondary mirror is off to one side and none of it, none of the radiation that hits the primary is blocked. And so this is called an offset Cassegrain system. And uh, this is used in some telescopes. Uh, uh, for example, you might have you know, like a satellite dish or something that uses this, this arrangement. The Green Bank Telescope also uses this type of arrangement. The problem with this is that there are some off axis issues because everything is now located so you're only using part of the parabola, you've lost the symmetry, and there may be some off-axis issues that come into play. So now that we've covered uh, some of the basics of telescope mounts, telescope focus arrangements, we'll move on to the most commonly used radio antenna. And uh, for this, the most commonly used radio antenna is a parabolic primary dish. It's fully steerable and it's an altitude azimuth mount. And the focus system is typically a Cassegrain focus system. And for example, if you look at Alma, that's what that uses. Uh, this is GMRT, and that also uses a Cassegrain system. The advantage of this system is that the optical axis and the antenna axis coincide. So it makes it a very symmetric system, and there are a lot of advantages to that type of system. So now that we've covered those, let's uh, 
talk a little bit about the properties of antennas. Uh, there are a few things that we need to consider when we are describing antennas. Uh, of course, the most important thing is what's the radiation pattern looks like, or what the beam pattern looks like. And the radiation pattern or the beam beta pattern pretty much describes what's the angular variation of the power. And then you move on to the directivity. Uh, so the simplest antenna, of course, uh, it's, is an isotropic radiator. So if you have a small radiation source and it radiates equal power in all directions. And so this power goes through this entire sphere, right, that's surrounding it, and pretty much over this entire surface area. And, in, and it basically radiates equally in all directions. So the directivity says, okay, how much of the power is directed into a given direction? And that's what directivity is. Uh, the next property is gain. Uh, of course, there will be some losses uh, due to this, etc. And so the gain takes into account uh, the, the losses. In. And so it's just basically directivity minus losses. Of course, we are interested in operating this telescope over the maximum possible bandwidth. And so that's an important parameter. Of course, we are also concerned about antenna polarization. What are the polarization properties of the antenna? One of the other things we need to consider is the efficiencies. How well does it receive or radiate? How much of the radiation does it couple from free space onto your device? Uh, or how well does it transmit? So if you put in a certain power at your feed, how well does it uh, receive or, or radiate? And uh, lastly, it's important to consider mechanical, uh, how to take into account mechanical considerations. These may include things like size and weight and tracking and control. All of these are really important because the bigger the antenna, the harder it is to control, the harder it is to track. And so it's important to take these into consideration as well. So I won't go too much through antenna beam pattern uh, properties. Uh, I'll leave these two slides in, the, in this talk. Uh, but basically what we want to know is, is how how does the antenna radiate into space and uh, so therefore one of the things that's important to see here is this formula that it says that essentially as your as your area increases of your dish then the beam size goes down and then the directivity and the gain both go up okay. and uh, so of course it's important to know what the antenna efficiency is what's the aperture efficiency of the antenna is and so we can decompose the aperture efficiency into various factors. Uh, some of these are what's the surface efficiency, of the errors in the surface that will affect the amount of radiation that you're coupling. And of course, I talked a little bit about the blockage right, for uh, for these primary uh, for these uh, antennas. So some of the sub reflector blocks some of the radiation. In addition, uh, when you have an antenna, you're trying to uh, couple radiation from the feed onto the antenna. And some of it may spill over, and that's what's called spillover efficiency. And there's also illumination efficiency, and then there are other mis miscellaneous losses, etc. And so it's important to try to see to minimize the the losses and increase your aperture efficiency as much as possible. But typically, most of the antennas of the SMA are at least uh, 67 or maybe 70 percent efficient. And it's a function of frequency. At uh, lower frequencies, they're a little bit more efficient than at higher frequencies. That, and you can see that by given by that root formula. In the beginning, I'm not wasn't going to do the math, so, but we'll try to talk a little bit about the antenna radiation uh, properties in a little bit more physical uh, manner rather than just using math. Uh, there are a few regions that we need to consider when we are thinking about uh, the antenna radiation pattern. And so the way it works is that uh, very near to the antenna, you have a region which is called the reactive near field. And this is where the oscillations are set up. So if you're going to show magnetic wave, you'll have all the oscillations sort of. So it's in a reactive zone where there are no losses. And then there is a radiative zone which starts after the reactive zone. There are two parts of the radiative, radiative zone. There's a near field and then there's a far field. The near field is often also called the frontal zone and the far field is called the frontal zone. And typically, obviously, for most of the sources that we're looking at, they're all in the far field. But there may be some instances when you're trying to measure the telescope using techniques such as holography, where you may actually be in the radiating near field, and then you'll have to make some near field corrections to your radiation pattern. So here's sort of a cutout which shows you what the, the beam pattern looks like. Uh, and so these are the typical quantities uh, that you will hear about. There's a main lobe or the major lobe of the, tel uh, of the radiation pattern. And then there are some side lobes or minor lobes on the side. And then finally, you might have some back lobes as well. And so that what this means is that the radiation is not all sent down the main lobe, but there will be a little bit of it leaking onto the various side lobes. 
typically these are much, much lower in amplitude. Uh, the important quantity to consider here is this first null beam bit or the half power beam bit. It says uh, okay, how much of the power is contained pretty much in the main lobe. And uh, that's what defines what's the size of the, of the uh, or the resolution essentially of your antenna. Uh, another thing, of course, is that uh, uh, it, it, instead of doing a lot of math, you can pretty much uh, guess that most of the time the internal patterns that you get are pretty much Fourier transforms of the aperture. And so if you have a circular aperture, then the Fourier transform of that is a Bessel function, and the internal pattern looks like a Bessel function. If you have a rectangular aperture, for example, a manual waveguide or something which is rectangular, in that case, you will get a sync function. So now we come to some of the antenna properties of the SMA antennas. SMA has eight antennas and each antenna is six meter in diameter. The optics uh, is often denoted by this number, F number, which is essentially the ratio of the focal length over the distance of the diameter of the dish. Uh, you will also see that the antenna is actually made up of 72 panels, and there are four concentric rings around which the panels are located. Each panel is actually made of machine cast aluminum. Uh, the, there's a backup structure, which is not a solid piece, but it is a backup structure, which is made up of carbon fiber struts with steel nodes, and that basically is where uh, the antenna panels are mounted. Uh, there are also heaters that we have to uh, take into account because it does get cold up there and it can snow, and, and so we need to be able to have heaters which can de-ice the antennas. The surface accuracy is an important uh, number that we have to consider, and this is about 12 microns for the SMA antennas. Uh, the secondary that's there is, is machined aluminum, it's a solid piece, and it actually can also chop. Normally, we don't do chopping when we're observing uh, um, observing in interferometry mode, but we can use chopping when we want to measure the pointing and other properties. Uh, talked a little bit already about the SMA optics, and I'm going to skip it. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that we want to measure is how good is the dish surface. And for this, we use holographic techniques. And this can uh, is also provide information on the illumination of the dish. And so in order to do this, we actually have a beacon, which is located on Subaru Telescope, which is on top, uh, on, a, on, a, on a hill located next to the SMA antennas. And that one can radiate some signals, which are, uh, which are at different frequencies. And we can use this to essentially measure what the beam pattern of the antenna is. And so the way it works is that it's still in interferometry mode, where we have one of the antennas that's fixed and looking directly at the, at, at the beacon. And the second antenna scans. As it scans, essentially, the, the, you, can get, you can use that information to obtain a map. And the serography map can also be used, then be used to measure what the panel errors are which need to be corrected. Now, the SMA antennas have very good uh, accuracy. It's about 12 microns in the best, in, in best possible cases. And also, it's very stable over long periods of time. Over about uh, four years, the surface did not change by more than 20, 24 microns. And the goal of the SMA antennas is to have a pointing accuracy to be better than two arc seconds. Uh, there are two ways in which we can do this. Uh, one of the traditional ways we've been using is an optical telescope, which is located uh, on each telescope. There's a small hole in the primary dish, and there's an optical telescope. And we can use this to look at a bunch of stars, and we can then use this, these measurements of the off, from the offset positions of these stars to determine what the pointing model parameters are. Uh, we can also, of course, do it, do this with radio uh, radio interferometric measurements of stars as well, of, of radio sources as well. And so we can use this to get an all sky radio pointing model. And uh, basically, in this way, in this case, what we're seeing here is that the model is really good because we have an RMS now of about a couple of seconds uh, in both azimuth and elevation. Uh, finally, we'll come to polarimetry observations of the SMA. Uh, typically, when we're discussing describing polarization, we use Stokes parameters, and the polarized radiation is described by four Stokes parameters, uh, in which uh, I is the total intensity of the emission, Q and U describe the linear polarized, linearly polarized intensity, V is the circular polarization. For a 100% polarized source, this is the formula, so it's just I is square root of Q squared plus U squared plus V squared. Oftentimes, most astronomical sources are only very partially linearly polarized, and typically this is maybe a percent or a few percent. Uh, so using the Stokes parameters, one can describe uh, various types of polarization. For example, if you have linearly polarized emission in this direction, 
In this case, Q is negative, U is zero, and there's no circular polarization. The Q is, if the polarization is in this direction, Q is positive. If the polarization is in this direction, Q is zero, and U is negative. So Q and U are slightly different. They're not at 90 degrees to each other, but they're actually at 45 degrees to each other. So there's a little bit of difference. You can't assume that Stokes parameters behave like normal vectors. If you have circular polarization, so we're moving around in a circle. Uh, in this case, Q equals U equals zero, and, uh, and basically the Stokes V parameter is negative. It's moving in an anti-clockwise direction. It moves in a clockwise direction, which is positive. And of course, in general, you have the elliptical polarization. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about the Stokes parameters. Let's talk about the, the response of the polarization to a uh, uh, response of the instrument or the interferometer to polarization from the sky. Uh, by design, the SMA has actually linear feeds, but for polarization observations, we put in a quarter wave plate which converts this linear polarization to circular polarization. And so once we do that, we can write down the interferometer response uh, based. So here R and L are the two feeds. R is right circular and L is left circular. And so there, of course, there, full, there will be four possible combinations. So you can write down the response in terms of these quantities, which are the gains. The Gs are the gains. Then obviously I, Q, U, and V are the Stokes parameters. And then we, can also, we also have this quantity called phi, which is actually the parallactic angle. And then we also have the, the instrumental polarization of the leakage, which is the unwanted signal, and it's usually represented by D. So this is a simple first order expansion of the polarization response. In general, it's second order and there are a number of other terms, but it's good to just see what it's doing. Now, when you're doing uh, observations where the polarization of the source is zero, so essentially there's only uh, Stokes, uh, Stokes total intensity, in which case you can put Q, U, and V to be equal to zero. And all you care about then is just RR and LL and it's just I. So the, so the way SMA does polarization is it uses two orthogonally polarized receivers tuned to the exact same frequency. And uh, so there are two possible combinations. You can use the 230 and 240 receiver, or you can use a 345 and a 400 receiver, and they both tune to the same frequency. So we have different quarter wave plates for the two different bands, and they're roughly optimized near CO2 to 1 and CO3 to 2 frequencies. Uh, so which are obviously 230 gigahertz and 345 gigahertz but they're very broadband and they can be used to within plus or minus 10 percent bandwidth so you can make polarization observations for as low as like 210 gigahertz all the way up to 250 gigahertz uh, for the 230 band and other, similarly for the 345 as well the instrumental polarization is about one percent near the central frequency which is near the co frequencies but it can climb to five to seven percent of the edges uh, in addition, the SMA antenna polarization is really good and it shows very little variability across the prime radio. So one of the things that we need to consider is that in order to do polarization properly, you do need dual polarized receivers. You need to have X and Y or L and R both present simultaneously. Uh, now one of the things as shown from the equations is that there are gain differences between the two feeds. And uh, we need to be able to calculate that. For that, of course, there are some spe special ideal routines which do this calculation. Uh, the polarization calibration is also done using media. And then once the calibration is done, then we can invert all the four stokes uh, to get IQ, U, and V, and then clean separately. And then we can combine the IQ, U images to get the polarized intensity, the polarization fraction, and the polarization angle. Uh, most of the time, you don't really have to care about all of these properties. But there are some situations where this is important because obviously we need to know what the primary beam is because if you want to make a primary beam correction, you need to know what the primary beam properties are. At the very least, you need to know what the size is. Uh, there are things like the illumination, uh, which is given by amplitude and phase, and that can affect the primary beam as well. Uh, and then finally, if you have surface errors, then those will produce phase errors, then it can cause decorrelation of the signal. Also, if your illumination is not very good, you may be picking up some, some of the emission from the ground, and that can lead to higher system temperatures and more noisy data. Yeah. In addition, if your antenna is not pointed correctly, it will lead to a loss in sensitivity. And of course, when you're observing polarization, you need to take into account antenna and instrumental polarization properties. Thank you.